The U.S. Postal Service honors legendary performer and civil rights activist Lena Horne on the 41st stamp of the Black Heritage Stamp Series. Lena Horne was a trailblazer in Hollywood for women of color and used her fame in entertainment to become an important civil rights spokesperson. Now today, Lena Horne, the 41st stamp on the Black Heritage um, series. Tell us, she performed right here in New York City. What impact did she have on New York City? Well, she, she was a good friend, and uh, she was uh, enormous, not only as a performer, but as a person. Everyone that knew her would tell you the same thing. And, and as far as her, her civil rights activism here? Oh, she was active, active for sure, and it made a big difference uh, when she was there, along with the rest of us. Did you ever catch some of her performances, maybe at the Cotton Club? And oh, yeah, oh yes, indeed. Some of the most elite clubs, do you remember which ones they were here in New York City? Well, I remember the Cotton Club, of course, and the Apollo Theater, and other such uh, renowned venues. And what do you think of the stamp? I like it a lot. It, it, the the, the uh, photographer did a great job. He really captured her. Thank you for joining us today for the dedication of the United States Postal Service's commemorative forever stamp honoring Miss Lena Horn. Well, good morning. In the summer of 1933, a nervous and self-conscious 16-year-old black girl from Brooklyn would travel to Harlem and audition for one of two highly coveted spots as a dancer in the world-famous Cotton Club. The Cotton Club was home to some of the greatest entertainers America has ever produced. Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, dancers Bill Bojangles Robinson, and Fayard and Nicholas and Harold Nicholas, the Nicholas brothers. The competition was fierce. Black women came from all over the country that day to audition. When Lena Horne's name was called, she was paralyzed with fear. She stumbled forward and felt she couldn't walk, much less dance. But as she began her routine, something happened, something that would happen time and time and time again throughout her fabled career. Heads turned, jaws dropped, the room got quiet. Everyone in the club realized there was something indescribably different about Lena Horne. She got the job and so began her illustrious professional career. This phenomena would happen again three years later, when famed band leader Noble Sissel turned to the 19-year-old Lena Horne as his lead vocalist and then recorded her for the first time. It happened again in 1940 when a white big band leader, Charlie Barnett, took the controversial step of hiring a black woman as the band's lead vocalist despite the inevitable backlash that Lena and the band would experience, especially while she toured in the South. It was about this time that Walter White, executive secretary for the NAACP, began fighting to change Hollywood's degrading portrayals of African Americans in the movies. Ever since D.W. Griffin's 1915 film, Birth of a Nation, which glorified the Klan and depicted black people as unintelligent, shiftless, and lazy, Hollywood had created a stereotype of black women as overweight and speaking broken English. The, uh, the other image was that of a scantily dressed prostitute. The NAACP realized the destructive impact those depictions were having on white America's perceptions of African Americans, as well as the damage those images were inflicting on African Americans themselves. Walter White looked for someone to recast the image of black women on the big screen. 
someone with impeccable style, grace, beauty, and intelligence. The woman he turned to was tw the 24-year-old jazz singer from Brooklyn, Lena Horne. Everything about Miss Horne flew in the face of Hollywood's racist stereotypes. MGM president Louis B. Mayer agreed to audition Miss Horn. That morning, she walked calmly into the office, signaled her pianist, and sang a spellbinding rendition of More Than You Know. Like so many before him, Louis Mayer was struck immediately by the unmistakable star quality of Lena Horn. So, in January 1942, the 24-year-old Lena Horne was signed to a seven-year film contract, an unmistakable feat at that time for African-American actresses in Hollywood. Ms. Horne's first two movies for MGM were Panama Hattie and Cabin in the Sky, where she sung what became a signature song for her, Stormy Weather. Those films were a revelation, particularly for African-American audiences. When Lena Horne came on screen, African-American moviegoers all over the country were filled with a sense of pride, in much the same way that the new heavyweight champion of the world, Joe Lewis, inspired pride throughout the African-American community. Ms. Horne would go on to appear in 24 films, including Death of a Gunfighter and the Wiz. But she was never given the opportunity to star in a leading role. This happened mostly because she refused to play stereotypical roles or roles she felt were beneath her, despite the negative impact it had on her career. But somebody had to refuse in order to inspire a Ruby D. Somebody had to stand up to inspire Cicely Tyson. Somebody had to walk away so there would be a Diane Carroll. Somebody had to say enough is enough so there would be a Viola Davis. Someone had to say here I stand so there could be an Octavia Spencer. Ms. Ms. Horn also paid a heavy price for her fierce commitment to the ongoing civil rights struggle. She wrote a column for The People's View, a newspaper founded by a young firebrand minister from Harlem's Abyssinia Baptist Church, the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Jr. In one column, she took the entertainment industry to task for continuing to pick blacks as, quote, silly, simple, shuffling types, laughing, dancing, and bowing their way through life. She worked with Paul Robeson, in planning a rally at Madison Square Garden to benefit Robeson's Council on, Eco on African Affairs, which sought to aid South African poverty. She traveled to Jackson, Mississippi to lend her support for the fight against segregation with Medgar Evers shortly before he was murdered in his driveway. During World War II, Ms. Horn entertained black servicemen, especially her beloved Tuskegee Airmen. And after the war, she worked on behalf of Japanese Americans who were facing discriminatory housing policies. She was on the platform at the 1963 March on Washington and supported the work of the Nas National Council of Negro Women. Her name is listed on the International Civil Rights Walk of Fame at the Martin Luther King Jr. National Historic Site. In her own way, she was a freedom fighter. But above all, all else, she was the consummate entertainer, appearing on 40 albums, wowing crowds in America and in Europe with her singing and majestic stage presence while fighting to end segregated entertainment venues, singing with the likes of Harry Belafonte, Tony Bennett, Billy Eckstein, Andy Williams, Frank Sinatra, and Junie Garland, just to name a few. She broke new ground for black entertainers on TV variety shows like The Ed Sullivan Show, which is the first time I saw her. Ms. Horn, Ms. Horn starred on Broadway in musicals like Jamaica, which helped to launch the career of a young dancer named Alvin Ailey, and young actors Ricardo Montalbaum and Ozzie Davis, 
while becoming the first African-American woman ever to be nominated for a Tony for best, mu for best Actress in a Musical, and winning that award later for her one-woman sh one show, Lena, The Lady and Her Music. Her appearances on TV's Sesame Street and The Muppet Show in the early 70s endeared Miss Horn to a new generation of young people all across America. The stamp we unveiled this morning features a photograph of Lena Horn taken by Christian Steiner. In the 1980s, Kristen Morthy colorized the original black and white photo using a royal blue for her dress, a color Miss Horn frequently wore. The stamp's background is reminiscent of Miss Horn's stormy weather album with a few clouds to add texture. I'd like to conclude by quoting Vernon Jordan. In 1983, the NAACP presented the Spingarn Medal, its annual award for outstanding achievement by an African American to Lena Horne. During that ceremony, Mr. Jordan said, quote, to Hollywood's shame, her roles were limited, but whatever Lena did was done with pride, with taste, with total and irrefutable dignity. And being the Lena that she was, proud, stubborn, and uncompromising, she helped us all walk a bit taller and smile a little broad broader. Right. So now, I would like to ask our special guest to join me in dedicating the United States Postal Service's 2018 Black Heritage Series stamp. Hello all. Before I tell you about my experience photographing the remarkable Lena Horn, I want to say that I feel honored that one of my photographs will be gracing a stamp of the United States Postal Service. <laughs> Their people who were in touch with me, Mike Owens, Artist Montgomery and Michael Henry have been great to work with, and I thank them. Also, Susan Rees, who oversaw my contract, has my heartfelt thanks. My session with Lena Horn was quite different to what I was used to. Those sessions were always based on developing an intimate personal connection with my subjects. Therefore, the arrival of a multitude of people absolutely scared me. <laughs> yes. Earlier that month, I had photographed Maria Callas, and my images of her convinced Michael Frazier, who was a producer of The Lady and My Music, that I should be the one to photograph Lena. The day before of our date, jewelry had been selected from Cartier and carefully laid out for her to choose from. On the day of the session, though, about 20 people had arrived in my place. And when Lena shortly came thereafter, she was in a prickly mood, ignoring me, zoomed in on the hairdresser and warned them that they will have a tough time with her difficult hair. Then yet another, another man arrived, whom nobody knew, and quietly sat down. Somebody noticed that he was wearing a gun, which prompted the producer to find out what his business was. It turned out he was security from Cartier. Okay, but I panicked more and more, since my actual studio was small, and picturing all these people crowding in, 
How could I possibly get a photo of Lena that was nothing but glossy, superficial photo, maybe beautiful, but had no personality? In desperation, I went to Michael, the producer, and told him that I wanted to be alone in the studio with Lena. All he said was, talk to her. And when I did, and all she said was, it's your show. The session was in the classical sonata form, an ABA form, meaning that she was in a bad mood in the beginning, complaining about the jewelry she did not like. So she had selected a pair of dangling diamond earrings. It so happened that a friend of mine had given me necklaces to photograph he had designed, quite different from Cartier's refined style. There are bold gold framed medallion necklaces that Lena loved and her mood changed completely. That brought the part B of the photo session. After a change into an elegant blue dress, she became talkative, told me animately about her life. We were able to laugh together. She even sang for me, all the while I got pictures I was feeling good about and thought she would too. The B sections lasted the longest, but with another dress change, A came back. And the camaraderie, camaraderie that I enjoyed disappeared, though not completely. Mind you, she had arrived about 10 a.m. and left in the afternoon at 4 p.m. Fast forward. My partner and I were invited to the opening of the show, including the reception and dinner. Everybody in the theater business was there. And first, they were crowding around Lena. I was standing in the sidelines, not wanting to compete. But things changed with the arrival of Elizabeth Taylor, who headed straight into the dining room. The well-wishers eagerly followed her, and momentarily, Lena stood alone. I took the opportunity and walked over to her. And when Lena saw me, she said, I don't know how you did it. I was in such a terrible mood that day, but I love the photos. And with that, she parted her blouse at her neck and said, and look what it brought me. She was wearing the necklace that the producer had purchased for her from my friend. That's it. Thank you very much. First of all, on behalf of my mother's family, I want to thank the U.S. Postal Service and Ronald Stroman, the Deputy Postmaster General, for this truly wonderful honor. And I especially want to thank Marissa Pittman, the Rights Acquisitions and Relationships Manager, and Michael Henry, the Stamp Development Specialist, for guiding the process to completion. And of course, I want to thank Christian Steiner for taking the most beautiful photographs ever of my mother. I also want to thank the wonderful singers of the Lena Horn campus of the Voice Charter School for lifting their voices here today. Can you hear me? Yes. And many thanks to Mr. Franklin Headley, the principal of the school. Are you there, Mr. Headley? <laughs> and I want to thank all of you who were able to come out this morning. Most of you are here because you knew my mother. I am so happy that we, her family and friends, are able to express the delight that I know she would have felt at this honor. Among family members, I've already introduced um, my, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, William, Tom, Jenny, Jake, Thea, and Sasha. Did I leave anybody out? Marion. She's an in-law. My mother would have been 100 years old on June 30th, 2017. It's wonderful that she should receive this honor so close to her centennial year. When I first read the list of past recipients in the Black Heritage series, I confess it brought tears to my eyes. Seeing those names all together moved me very much. And to think of my mother among them was most moving of all. There are 40 amazing people on the list 
25 men and 15 women. Of the men, my mother touched history by sitting on the lap of James Weldon Johnson at the age of two, when her grandmother made her a lifetime member of the NAACP, and counting Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois as special friends and mentors. As a World War II sweetheart of the Tuskegee Airmen, she knew and respected General B. O. De Benjamin O. Davis, Sr., whose son commanded the Airmen. And naturally, because she was born in Brooklyn, she knew and loved Jackie Robinson, everybody's hero. Above all, I know she would have been most happy to join the list of 15 women, all of them firsts. Heroes, activists, founders, educators, legislators, an actress, an athlete, two singers, an entrepreneur, and an aviatrix, my favorite sexist title. Some, like Harriet Tubman and Sojourner, Sojourner Truth, with arguably the most beautiful name in American history, are household names. Others should be better known, like Ida B. Wells, the first person to keep official lynching statistics, Bessie Coleman, the first woman to receive an international pilot's license, and a celebrated stunt pilot before Lindbergh flew the Atlantic, Anna Julia Cooper, known as the mother of black feminism, Born a slave, she became an educator and one of the first black women to earn a PhD, who insisted on studying in fields normally closed to women. And Patricia Harris, who was both Secretary of Health, Education and Welfare and Housing and Urban Development, as well as the first African-American woman to serve as chief of a major US corporation. Many of these women had to blaze two trails, that of gender as well as race. Several women on the list my mother counted as friends. She loved Mary McLeod Bassoon, the first African-American woman to be head of a federal agency, and my great uncle Frank Horn's boss in the New Deal. She also knew and greatly admired Marian Anderson, a civil rights trailblazer and the first African-American to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. Hattie McDaniel, the first African-American to win an Oscar, was my mother's friend and supporter when she first arrived in Hollywood. My mother loved Ella Fitzgerald, known as the First Lady of Song, as an artist, a friend, and a contemporary. Ella was two months older. My mother also knew and admired Barbara Jordan, the first African-American woman to be elected to the Texas legislature, and in 1976, the first woman and first African-American to address a Democratic National Convention. I know that my mother would be so happy to follow her good friend, Dorothy Height, the 2017 honoree and leader of the National Council of Negro Women. My mother was the first African-American woman to receive a long-term Hollywood studio contract, the first African-American to sit on the board of the Screen Actors Guild, and the first African-American to appear on the cover of a movie magazine, none of which actually made her a movie actress. Hollywood simply did not know what to do with someone who had to be cut out of the picture before it was allowed to be shown in southern states. She was sometimes accused of being an aloof performer. She explained that because she was so often the first black to appear in certain venues, she never had any idea of what her reception might be. As all the amazing honorees in the Black Heritage series knew very well, to paraphrase the, Sem the Sesame Street song about being green, it's not easy being a trailblazer. As we honor these women and men for their great talent and abilities, we must also honor them for the courage it took for them to become, as the Postal Service notes in celebrating the black heritage stamps, people, events, and cultural milestones that are unique to our great nation. Thank you. With this Lena Horne's daughter, could you tell us first of all about uh, your feelings about this stamp today? Oh, I think it's so beautiful. We're so thrilled and honored. It's such a great honor to have a stamp. And it's beautiful. It's one of those beautiful stamps I've ever seen. And, and, and tell me now, being her daughter, tell us a, a little private story about Lena and, and the type of woman she was. She was fabulous. She was wonderful. She was great fun. We had a lot of fun times. She was a great reader. We liked old movies. Um, she loved Christian Steiner's photographs, uh, which is uh, what the stamp is. And she was just, uh, she wasn't like a typical mother, but she was, a, uh, she was typical in that we had a great relationship. And, and what influence did she have on the civil rights movement? Well, she had a great influence on women in Hollywood in the civil rights movement. 
because she was the first black woman to get a uh, Hollywood contract. She opened the doors, as the Postmaster General uh, said, uh, for many other people. And you're quite successful yourself, an author. What, what role did she help play with your development? Well, she was very encouraging about my writing. She insisted that I go to college and do all the things that one should do, which I wasn't that keen about, but I was glad that I did. And uh, she was very enthusiastic about my books, which was great. Thank you. And supportive. She was very supportive. And I'm Crystal Hart reporting on the Lena Horn stamp here in New York City. Hope you've enjoyed the show and thanks for watching. Stormy weather.